Well, thank you very much for coming along. It's great to see so many people uh, interested in uh, climate change and how we can solve it. And of course, it's very topical uh, that there is uh, a member from the Agenda Foundation to talk about the, the recent uh, Dutch case. And we're looking forward to hearing about that. What I thought I might do is give you a very quick overview of the types of litigation that have been happening all around the world. Uh, I'm going to try and do that in less than half an hour. <coughs> so it will be a bit quick. But my purpose is really just to show you what's happening and the creative ways in which uh, maybe citizens, but also governments, have been taking action in the courts to try and force other governments and the private sector to do something about the problem of climate change. So, these are the various areas within which uh, litigation has been brought. I'm going to show you some examples from all of those uh, different areas. The first is the, we would say in Australia, the common law of tort, but also tort is in civil law countries, uh, also in the Dutch countries, of course, referred to as delict. And tort, of course, was one of the bases for the Dutch case, uh, the, the negligence, the duty of care. But the ones that we see uh, have been mainly in America, uh, particularly in uh, nuisance. I'm going to show you some of those cases. Nuisance can be divided into both a public nuisance and a private nuisance. Public nuisance is affecting more members of the public than a private nuisance, which affects private individuals. Two of the more famous cases were brought uh, by state governments as well as environmental NGOs. The first was against a group of uh, electric power companies and these were responsible for a considerable proportion, 10% of all of the uh, carbon dioxide emitted in the United States. So they had a critical mass of defendants. And they brought it in public nuisance uh, and what they wanted was for those uh, private sector uh, entities to cap their greenhouse gas emissions. There's various grounds upon their standing that they brought it, uh, but mainly to protect the citizens and to protect public lands for the state governments and for the NGOs because they held certain private lands as conservation lands and they were wanting to protect those because they were going to be adversely affected by uh, the uh, climate change. The second uh, case was uh, California, and it was suing uh, General Motors as well as other manufacturers of automobiles. Uh, the logic was that they uh, emit greenhouse gas emissions by the combustion within the engines of the cars. And again, they made a significant contribution to America's uh, greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions. So they're going to in public nuisance. Now, these were in the federal uh, courts, and they start off in the district court, and they were suing under the federal common law, uh, not the state common law. Uh, they were initially dismissed by the trial courts, the district courts, uh, on the basis of uh, justiciability. It's a legal concept uh, associated with whether it's a proper question to be determined by the courts rather than the parliament or by the executive government. So they were dismissed in the first instance, but they appealed to the Court of Appeals, uh, and the, in the Court of Appeals they reversed that and said, no, these are questions that the courts can resolve. The, in the case of the electric power case, the electric power companies then appealed again to the highest court in America, the Supreme Court, and uh, the Supreme Court allowed that appeal. Uh, but they did so not on the basis that there was not a political, there was a political question uh, which wasn't suitable for the courts or that wasn't standing, 
but rather they said there was a federal statute, the Clean Air Act, and that displaced the federal common law of nuisance, so this was a displacement ruling. Another public nuisance case was brought by the um, native Anupia village in Kivalina in Alaska, and that's it in the photo there. As you can see, it is very vulnerable to climate change. Um, they brought it against the oil, power, coal companies, the fossil fuel companies. That's just a close-up of the erosion that's happening uh, on the, the village. You can see that's on the, uh, the left-hand side of that village as we're looking at the screen. Uh, and the erosion, there used to be sea ice there, and that's been uh, melted, and now the waves are just coming in and eroding it, and the whole village will have to move. Uh, so they sought monetary damages from these various fossil fuel uh, companies, but they uh, were dismissed again at the district court on the uh, justiciability of standing grounds. They appealed, uh, but this time they, the district court's ruling was upheld, but on this Supreme Court ruling of displacement that the uh, federal common law was displaced by the Clean Air Act, therefore they couldn't succeed and they weren't able to get leave to go to the Supreme Court. So, so far not too much success uh, in public nuisance. What about private nuisance? Well, we haven't had too many cases in private nuisance, but essentially where we think the uh, actions will be in relation to not um, the mitigation uh, the failure to mitigate, but more that they've taken action to try to do something, but that action in itself was unsuccessful and has caused harm in some way. So, uh, for example, uh, if they were to put in certain works which are poorly located or designed or constructed, then that actually may make the problem worse rather than better, and then people may be able to take action in private uses. Negligence. Um, so this is where there is a duty of care. Um, the action could be either for a uh, failure to mitigate, so to try and stop the greenhouse gases in the first place, or a failure to take action about adaptation to try and deal with the effects of climate change. Now, the first one about uh, duty of care to mitigate is going to be more difficult um, and if we thought about who are the, in the private sector, who are going to be the likely uh, defendants, well they could be the producers of fossil fuels, they could be the users of fossil fuels, or they could be the manufacturers of products that itself use uh, fossil fuels. Now to that we could add the governments themselves, uh, as in the, the, the Dutch case. Uh, there are elements in a negligence action which would have to be established, each of them have some difficulties um, to do. The law of negligence was not particularly adapted to these new situations, and so uh, there's going to be, I think, some time before we see some uh, successful actions uh, under some of these uh, private uh, negligence actions. But in relation to failure to adapt, I think we might see more success um, now, why is that? Because they're more common. Uh, the courts would find these to be more familiar. So it could be the grant of a development approval in a flood-prone coastal zone or a bushfire zone, which is going to be uh, more severely affected under uh, climate change. It could be the adequacy of the building standards with strain, sort of, you know, um, cyclones or tornadoes or flooding. It could be a responsibility for erosion or landslides. It could be that the emergency procedures uh, are quite inadequate and therefore you know, loss and damage flows from that. We saw that with the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Uh, it could be a failure to take action for disease prevention. Dengue fever, Ross River fever, malaria are extending their range by reason of climate change. It could be a failure to protect public natural assets. So those are areas where we could see it. Uh, there have been some actions with a little climate change over uh, lay in about the uh, fires down in Victoria and also the flooding up in Brisbane. 
All right, moving now to conspiracy. A conspiracy consists of agreement of two or more persons to do an unlawful act, that's one, or to do a lawful act, but to do so by an unlawful means. Now, it's starting to be used in climate change litigation, but where it uh, found some success was actually in the tobacco litigation, uh, where there were uh, actions against the tobacco companies that they had conspired to deceive the public about the dangers of cigarettes. So that concept has been picked up in some of the American cases, the, the Coma, uh, Murphy Oil one, uh, this is a Hurricane Katrina one, they did say that there was, amongst other actions, a conspiracy. Uh, there's, by the way, Hurricane Katrina uh, coming in. And that was, uh, the claim was that the particular defendants uh, knew of the dangers of greenhouse gas emissions, but they had unlawfully disseminated misinformation about these dangers in furtherance of a civil conspiracy to decrease public awareness of the dangers of global warming. Now that claim has never come to, uh, be, uh, to be determined. Why? Because they dismissed the whole claims uh, on the basis of lack of standing. Uh, so it never got past the procedural uh, hurdle. Uh, it was also raised in the Kivalina case that I showed you earlier, but again, that got dismissed uh, for different reasons. Um, so they're then the litigants in, um, the plaintiffs in uh, the Coma case tried again to lodge a new uh, lawsuit, but they uh, were dismissed on the basis that they uh, had already uh, had their claim uh, determined. So a race to your car and a stop -all. Okay, now moving to a different topic, and this is the topic of the public trust. Now there is a, a doctrine that comes from Roman laws, come into the common law, uh, that is that there are certain common natural resources that are held in trust by the government. Uh, the air, the running waters, the seashores, the, the you know, open seas, they're all ones that are not capable of appropriation by individual persons. And so that the government holds these assets in trust for the benefit of the citizens. Uh, that's the concept. So they've taken this uh, idea in America and started to bring some actions that uh, there has been a breach of the public trust uh, in air because of the pollution of air by the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So the first case was in Alaska in 2014. Um, the standing justiciability was upheld. Uh, they sought a declaration uh, that the atmosphere was a public trust resort. But the court said, look, we don't just make a, a, a bare declaration. Uh, there has to be some justiciable issue. Uh, so they weren't prepared to make that uh, declaration. They're also a little bit nervous about uh, trying to say uh, what should be done in the future as opposed to what has been done in the past. And the, what the, the plaintiffs were asking was it to really get direction as to what the government ought to be doing. And the Alaskan court was, um, felt reluctant to do that. A more recent one, only in March this year, um, which was in New Mexico, um, that failed not because it wasn't recognized that it was part of the public trust, the air, um, but rather that they felt that uh, it had already been incorporated into the Constitution <coughs> and a particular Air uh, Quality uh, Control Act. So they said this concept of the public trust is, has been statutorily incorporated and therefore that displaces the, the common law and so they no longer needed to look at the common law. A very recent case in Oregon uh, is a bit surprising I think. Uh, it's um, question whether the atmosphere is a natural resource at all. How do you see that? Well, how that could be uh, not considered to be a, a natural resource um, and all one which the public trust applies. Um, they did recognize that submerged uh, and submersible lands were part of the public trust, but then said they couldn't see any fiduciary uh, trust obligation on the government to try and protect those submerged and submersible lands. Uh, so not surprising that the plaintiffs appealed that in July this year. All right, moving on to now misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is found in tort, but it's also found in contract and trade practices law. 
So what could be a misrepresentation? Well, we see these coming up with sort of greenwashing claims. So, we, you know, that something's got low carbon emissions or that whatever the product or service is, it, that the carbon emissions have been offset or that you can, consumer can offset them by doing this in a certain way. Now, if those representations are false, then the customer who has been misled by those representations may have an action. Now, we see this in the trade practices field, um, and the Australian um, Competition Consumer Commission has been taking actions in respect of greenwashing. Uh, one claim was by um, GM Holden about Saab cars uh, a good few years ago. Uh, here's the advertisement, uh, and basically uh, they said that these uh, particular ones uh, were cars were green, the carbon emissions were neutral, that you could switch to carbon neutral motoring, and they would plant 1780 trees in the first year after. Uh, you purchased your car as a carbon offset. You think they were right? No. I don't think so. Uh, well then, of course, there was a net release of carbon dioxide by operating any car. Uh, planting 17 trees, surprise, surprise, didn't really provide an offset at all. Uh, and really, the cars that they were selling were no different to any other of the cars that they'd been so selling, so it was just a bit of uh, puffery. So they were uh, forced to um, uh, give various undertakings uh, and to train their marketing staff and ended up not planting 17 trees but 12,500 12, trees uh, for the uh, particular car sold. There have been other ones as well. Uh, DeLonghi uh, had a portable air conditioner that wasn't environmentally friendly. Goodyear had tyres uh, that they said didn't cause any uh, harm. Um, Prime Carbon said that they uh, had carbon credits that they didn't. Uh, V8 supercars um, said they'd plant some trees which would offset the emissions that weren't. Uh, and there's another one about renewable energy certificates. So there was a whole series of cases uh, where trying to keep uh, companies honest about their claims. Right, now moving to administrative law. So there can be only three ways we can look at this, judicial review, some sort of uh, civil actions, and uh, merits review. So judicial review, this is where we're reviewing the legality of government action uh, if it infringes some statutory or common law rule. One of the problems in, in uh, judicial review has been standing, the, the right of a person to, or a group to bring those proceedings to court. And one of the more famous cases was that brought by Massachusetts as well as uh, some environmental NGOs in America about the uh, Environment Protection Authority's uh, refusal to make a regulation uh, regulating the emissions of greenhouse gases for uh, motor vehicles. Uh, that went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the standing. And what's of interest was they found that the state of uh, Massachusetts, although the injury was minor in one sense compared to everything else, it still was sufficient. There was sufficient causation uh, that uh, if you reduce greenhouse um, the gas emissions from uh, automobile emissions, that wasn't, uh, was hardly a tentative step, so that was okay. And there were remedies that could be taken, so they found that there was standing. And that's been important because subsequently, of the EPA did change its policy and go and start regulating uh, emissions from motor vehicles. Once you get through standing, you've got to say what, do you, what is the, the error of the law, and often it's been that there's been a failure of the decision maker to take into account a relevant matter. Now, relevant matters can be either expressed or implied. So express matters, if you look at our um, local environmental plans in New South Wales, you'll find that there's often a matter which requires consideration of the effect of coastal processes and coastal hazards on a proposed development, as well as the effect of a proposed development causing uh, issues for you know, coastal processes and coastal hazards. So that's an example of an express matter. But what about implied matters? 
Well, here was an example. This is a lovely one down in Victoria, the Hazelwood Power Station. Uh, only a mother would love it. Uh, and then you see um, this. There was going to be an expansion of the uh, coal fields. What were they going to do that for? Well, it was going to supply coal to this uh, Hazelwood Power Station. Um, but they didn't take into account the fact that supplying more coal to be burnt here would actually increase greenhouse gas emissions. So that was held to be a relevant matter that needed to be taken into account in deciding whether or not to allow more coal mining. Another one was what happens when you uh, mine coal? Well, ultimately it's going to be burnt. Should you take into account the greenhouse gas emissions that come from that <laughs> downstream burning of the coal? Uh, yes, at the uh, court in grey. Um, what about when you go and put a uh, development on a coastal plain that is subject to flooding and uh, sea level rise and surge? Uh, should you take into account the effect of greenhouse gas, emit sorry, well, that climate change uh, on that development? Uh, yes, at the Land Rider Court in Walker. No, said the Court of Appeal. Uh, The, there's the particular area down at Sand and Point. You can see why it is uh, subject to both flooding from the uh, land side and also um, storm surge uh, to level rise from the seaside. Uh, another case was up uh, Old Bar, uh, very uh, high erosion. If you go up there, you can see a lot of these houses almost disappearing into the sea, uh, and the, the it was said that they have to take into account the climate change induced coastal erosion on new dwellings. Uh, Horton concerned uh, Bayswater uh, Power Station uh, and the challenge was whether to uh, consider the um, climate change. Uh, it was held uh, that it wasn't a mandatory consideration in the particular circumstances of that case. There's a number of other cases I've got from uh, America and the United Kingdom and New Zealand uh, where they've said the greenhouse gas emissions are relevant, for example, on the effect on biodiversity or on an airport uh, expansion uh, and the New Zealand one turned on the particular statutory uh, construction. There also might be procedural requirements that they have to follow. Uh, one of what normally is environmental impact assessment. Is the environmental impact assessment adequate in considering uh, the impacts of climate change on a particular development? Gray, as I've told you, was held to be inadequate for not considering those downstream um, emissions. Uh, an American case was held that a, a new power line uh, the EIA for that power line should have taken into account the greenhouse gas emissions from the uh, power stations in Mexico to which this power line was going to be connected. Uh, another one was about a railway line which was going to bring more coal uh, to a power plant and increase the coal consumption and they needed to take into account the uh, greenhouse gas emissions when considering whether to uh, undertake that rail project. Okay. okay, civil enforcement, so there can be various private actions about breaches of the law, it can work both ways, uh, the cases up in um, uh, Byron Bay, um, on the long little spit, uh, there's Mr Vaughan looking uh, forlorn, um, uh, when there was erosion of his particular uh, property, so there was mutual litigation between him and uh, Byron Bay Council about that little episode. Um, there's also been actions about the, uh, the Bayswater power station, there it is. Um, and this was whether there had been a breach of the uh, particular law, Protection Environment Operations Act, which dealt with uh, emissions of uh, waste. Uh, that ultimately was an uh, unsuccessful claim. It turned on the particular construction of the uh, the license, but I'm just showing you the idea uh, for which was pursued. Okay, coming sometimes courts and tribunals actually have the right uh, to remake the decision of government, and in those circumstances, courts have been taking into account the effects of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change on development. 
So uh, one was the South Australian case where there would be erosion uh, which would make a coastal land subdivision unacceptable. Uh, you can see there it is. The proposed development was right on the coast and the, the modelling showed that a lot of that land was going to be uh, eaten into by reason of uh, climate change uh, consequences. Uh, down in Gippsland, again, there was a refusal of uh, dwellings because of the severity of storm events. Uh, another one was uh, in Gippsland there. Now, sometimes you have to take into account both public and private uh, interests. And with renewable energy, uh, there can be, of course, the benefits that come from having, say, wind power, not too many solar projects, but wind power, but of course it does have a private impact. Uh, people find them unsightly, some people say noise, uh, but you have to balance those. So a number of cases have tried to look at the, the benefits that come for climate change by renewable energy against the private interests. Uh, that was one I dealt with, that's the Taranga uh, wind farm. Uh, you can make up your own view as to whether it's a blight or uh, on the landscape or not. Um, then, if you're putting conditions of approval on, then of course you can take into account the effects of um, climate change. So you might build uh, structures to withstand sea level rise, or that you might require offsetting of um, the greenhouse gas emissions. So now moving to constitutional law, we don't have too much here in Australia, but overseas there's been a particular uh, flurry of litigation concerned with uh, the constitutional rights. Uh, the sort of things we see is that the right to life can include the right to a clean and healthy environment. Uh, you could have, if you've had success in a court and that the government doesn't implement it, that might infringe your right to a fair trial. If your house is going to be adversely affected by greenhouse or by climate change, then that might infringe your right to respect for family and private life. So we see a variety of cases, particularly in Europe, uh, dealing with these human rights. That's the agenda one, so we're going to skip through that. Um, other international law can deal with transboundary effects, and of course, quintessentially, climate change, greenhouse gases, are uh, a transboundary effect. So there may be more in concerning that. Uh, there's also, of course, in the ranches where governments actually take some actions, uh, the persons who are adversely affected by that, the industries, may actually take action trying to challenge that. And so the Air Transport Association of America tried challenging a lot of the uh, UK and EU regulations uh, dealing with greenhouse gas emissions uh, from uh, aeroplanes. Uh, so there were various challenges uh, in uh, Europe about that in the um, of justice. All right, and another case in the EU uh, concerned in Belgium, and it was concerning with whether you need to get green certificates for renewable energy, whether you needed to take it from uh, the particular country or you could take it from other uh, countries in Europe. Uh, interesting, there's the development of the idea that because climate change is a global issue that some of our institutional adjudicative forum uh, fora are not adequate to deal with the uh, particular disputes. And so there's been a push to say, should we actually be having other uh, types of adjudicative fora, including an international court for the environment? And so they're looking at seeing as what sort of uh, places can hear these disputes. So there's your very quick run around the world. Uh, hopefully that gives you some idea of what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, and I'll leave you with uh, one iconic and one perhaps uh, contestable uh, item of the landscape. Thank you. <laughs>